be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognize and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present. Uh, I have apologies and leave of absence from uh, Councillor Mackey and Councillor Kira, and just note that Councillor uh, Moran and Kuros uh, will be a few moments late, um, but I understand they're on their way. Um, I'll just seek a mover and a seconder um, uh, for the minutes. Um, and I think uh, Jenny will use electronic hands, will we? Yep. Thank you, Councillor Sims, seconded Councillor Martin. Members, were there any uh, points on that? No hands are up. Okay, we'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. All right, we will go, uh, there are no presentations. Um, did, uh, uh, Ian, did you wanna, did you wanna, oh no, sorry, we're coming to that at 5-2, all good. No presentations and uh, we'll go straight to 5-1, which is Kid Kid King Rodney Park uh, Maintenance and Storage uh, Building. Um, and we'll take this one as red, I think it was fairly straightforward. Were there any queries on this? Councillor Martin. Uh, yeah, just one very brief question. It's only a five-year lease. Uh, why only five years? Uh, thank you, Councillor. That's been the request of the proponent. Thank you. Okay, any other points, members? No, all right, we'll move on to uh, 5.2, which was obviously um, withdrawn. Did um, Ian or did you want to make a remark, Ian or Mark? No, over, over yep. Oh, I'm sorry, can you see me? Yep. For you, Chair. Uh, apologies this one, we just got a little bit of fine tuning to do on the report um, and the draft chart. Um, we've had some, some excellent feedback from, um, from the industry and we just want to make sure that uh, report is fully encompasses all that feedback. So apologies, uh, rather than do a late circulation, I'd rather make sure the details are right. Well, thank you, Ian. All right, uh, moving uh, properly on to 5.3, Adelaide 500, 2021 declarations consultation. Any uh, questions or comments on that? We've got the Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, just that um, we've obviously, this has come through APLA um, and I just wanted to uh, advise uh, members that the super loop is coming to uh, APLA this week. Yeah, I'm trying to think whether it was this week or next week, this week, um, just to discuss the cleared, declared area and how they set up and pack down and all of that, which may be of interest to some members if they're not familiar with the way the Adelaide 500 is staged in Victoria Park. Um, so just an open invitation that you're welcome to join us if you would like to hear from them at that presentation. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Councillor Martin. So, a couple of quick questions. Um, I, I just again asked the question, um, this is coming to council as a document, um, or committee rather, as a document that will go to council that cannot be changed. And therefore, the recommendation to council next Tuesday is that we endorse the declared area and the declared period and the prescribed works. And yet APLA hasn't even considered it. Uh, and I just wonder what that says to APLA. Um, but separately to that, um, uh, I, I just wanted to be reminded, can the administration- Sorry, sorry councillor, I've just got a point of clarification there. APLA has considered this on the 6th of August. 
So what um, APLA asked for was a separate brief briefing as the Lord Mayor just described. So APLA has considered this item. Okay, all right. Thank you, Deputy CEO. Back to um, Council. So APLA has approved the prescribed period, declared period and prescribed works. We'll just get a yes. Yes, that is correct, Councillor. Oh, well, I, I stand corrected. Thank you for the clarification. Um, can the administration tell me the extent, I'm trying to remember the extent of the financial losses sustained by the event in 2020? Uh, Councillor, that information will be held by the event organisers, not us, so no, I can't confirm. Oh, it's all right. There was a, a bit of publicity at the time. And how much are we giving to this event in sponsorship or grants or whatever? Um, it's $50 in sponsorship, Councillor. I'm sorry. Uh, there was a hiccup on the line. $50,000? Um, yes, yes, it's it. Um, I'm just trying to find where the... Does it say it in the report? I thought it did. No, I didn't see it. Okay, no, but I can confirm it's $50,000. Okay, thank you. Nothing more? So, sorry, that's it? Okay. Sorry, Lord Mayor, your hand was up. Was that was that, that point of clarification? It, it was, but it's also to say that um, there were many things that were considered uh, in this uh, at APLA, including uh, the ability for people to still move through the site, how the declare, declared site uh, would uh, work with other sites in the vicinity, such as Gluttony. Um, so what we ask for, though, is because of, there's a lot of new members is that they come and talk to us about this, which is why I made the offer to members, but it has already been considered. Thank you. Right, any further points on this before we move on? No, okay, we'll move on to 5.4, the proposed event in the Parklands, Archies 2020. And um, sorry, Jenny, that just messes with my um, with my view. All right, uh, members, questions on this one? Councillor Martin. Uh, just a brief one. Um, uh, the administration at 16 says that Adelaide High School, which is right next door to where this event is being staged, is generally supportive. What are they not supportive of? Uh, thank you, Councillor. So as the um, paragraph 16 continues, it's they've asked in particular that security and cleaning um, is considered by the event organisers if required. So those were the two areas of potential concern. Okay. And uh, what about uh, parking demand? Uh, as we all know, Adelaide High School has night classes. Is there any concern about um, parking problems associated with the event um, impacting on uh, high school night classes? Uh, not that the high school expressed uh, to us, councillor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, councillor Martin. Any further uh, questions or comments on this? No, okay, we'll move on to 5.5, five. City of Adelaide's submission for the Green Industries SA. South Australia Waste Strategy 2020-2025 and Food Waste Strategy Consultation Drafts. That title's definitely been written by a public servant. Um, any uh, comments, members, questions, points of clarification? 
thought it was a very good piece of work. No, Councillor Martin. Oh, sorry. Hold on. You're not. You're not with us yet. Thank you. How about that? Yep. Okay. Uh, look, not the content, but uh, the process. Why are we saying at pages thirty-eight and forty-one that legislated weekly waste collection is a problem? Um, when we're actually out at public consultation asking people whether they want uh, weekly red bin services. Sh shouldn't uh, our view for this submission be informed by the consultation, not the other way around? Um, through you, the chair. Um, so um, that's, that statement is consistent with pre a previous statement that we have made on a previous submission in January. Um, and we've already got an extension to the submission date. So we just wanted to flag it with them that that was a previous decision um, and position of council. So, uh, so you're correct, we asked, we will actually be helping with our community as well on that matter. Okay, but that's our position uh, before the consultation. Uh, that's what you're saying, yeah, that's fine, I understand. Members, any further points or comments? No. All right. Thank you, Michelle, but don't go anywhere. Five, six, corporate climate change risk assessment. I'm not surprised. Welcome, Robert. Thanks, um, Chair. And um, Look, thank you to um, those that put together this report. I think it's a really um, groundbreaking report. Um, I've read through it in detail. There's lots of things that come out of it um, in terms of, you know, the implications of climate change for council. Um, I know that the report uh, mentions that there are risks for a range of our operations, town hall, the golf course, the aquatic centre, Rundle Mall, U parks, the central market, the parklands, our roads, our footpaths, and the library. Um, so significant uh, risks for us to um, manage. One of the recommendations that comes out of the report is um, that more work be done in terms of identifying key actions. I, I note that that's a recommendation for administration, or administration of putting forward that recommendation for our next meeting. Um, but the other key point is closure of risks and that there be a public register to flag risks. Is that something that is going to be undertaken by administration? I've got a few questions, Chair, but I'll start with that one. Yes, yeah, certainly. Sorry, Michelle. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself through the chair. Um, so um, with that recommendation, you will, you will see, obviously, that this is a risk report and it's being disclosed to the public. So. Um, we have done that through through this report being um, considered by council in a public forum rather than in a confidential forum. But and then a... Sorry, and then obviously in terms of future risks, um, disclosure of them would obviously just depend on whether they are commercial in nature or, or confidential matters. So um, I would I would uh, say that we would take that um, on every matter as it. Um, is relevant. The way I read it was they talked about making this document a public facing document in terms of and having ongoing uh, disclosure and capture of risks. So I guess what you're saying, Michelle, is you, you've considered you done that by um, making the report available, but going forward, you'd be making us aware of risks that has been out. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's correct. So of course, um, if, if say there was a, a legal liability risk that um, came up in future years or decades, then that may not be appropriate because it might um, uh, impact on our, um, you know, um, legal position on a matter, whereas, you know, other risks might be quite appropriate to disclose. So it, that's really the work of that next stage is to really understand these risks better and to understand when they're actually going to um, uh, present themselves to us because we're talking about a long time frame. You know, this report looks at 20 
2090. So it's not about making decisions right now on every matter, but it's about having good information in the future so that we can be prudent in um, our decision making um, and, and understand um, all of the things that are in front of us. And I'm assuming then that as part of the action that will be informed by the um, potential immediacy and consequences in terms of when that work comes back to council. Uh, absolutely. So in terms of the action plan, that process would look at what are the near term risks that we need to consider and then and perhaps take action on and, and what are the long term risks that we need to have an eye to the future, maybe decades in the future, um, but we need to be cognizant of that now, particularly given the long lifetime of our assets, you know, some of the assets are over 100 years old um, and, and when we're building have that type of life span as well. So it's being aware of what um, things could present under various scenarios in the future. One of the um, key assets that's um, identified as um, being at risk, in fact, I think the, the report talks about being at risk of being a stranded asset is um, the U parks. And there's going to be an impact uh, that will flow from increase in frequency of very hot days increased duration of heat waves and it suggested in the report that that would impact on patronage as well as impact on uh, staff working at the U Park. I'm just wondering um, whether administration has a view on how we might transition away from uh, reliance on that asset and in particular um, whether we are going to reassess um, the ongoing focus on promotion of the U Park because We've got this report that's been commissioned that's potentially going to be a stranded asset and we've got a month that's dedicated to its promotion and we're also investing in a range of other things. Is there a view on how we start to begin that transition? Uh, so I don't think that that is um, an answer that I can make today or on behalf of council. It's really council's decision. What I can say though is we already know through studies that have been done in Victoria that when you have extreme heat, the economic activity in the city reduces. So part of this is understanding uh, and making sure that the city is resilient um, and it is climate ready and it's a welcoming place for people to come in and visit, for people to live here and for businesses to operate. There's no direct, um, and it may not be a question for you, Michelle, and I'm happy to direct it to others, but there's no plan around how we might deal with this moving ourselves away from this potential stranded asset going forward. So I would just say to that, that the, the whole point of um, undertaking a climate action plan is to better understand the timing of those types of issues. So um, they're not necessary. We can see at the moment that you know um, our car parks are quite often full. So the timing is probably not right now. But there may be a time in I don't know five, ten, twenty, fifty. Don't know what the timing is um, to consider those assets and whether they ought to, uh, how we ought to manage them. So that's really the point of the next step is to prioritise what are the near term issues and what are the ones that we we you know have a decision pathway that perhaps might be in the future. Thank you. And one last um, question. I, I noted um, the report talks about um, Council's work on carbon neutrality being advanced, um, which uh, is great. Was that assessment made before or after the commitment was made to hold Drivers Month in the City of Adelaide? Uh, so, so that assessment was based on the informed city tool, which is a tool that looks at governance. So documents within councils, so strategic documents within councils. Um, it's been applied to over 350 councils across Australia. Um, so it, it really looks at the policy um, of council that is available in its strategic documents. So it would not um, consider uh, uh, any um, individual initiatives uh, and it was done before. Okay, I, I thought so. Look, thank you, thank you very much. Oh, <clears throat> thanks, Robert. Members, any other questions on the report? No. 
Councillor Martin. Um, uh, yes. Um, look, uh, can I just preface it by saying that this is an excellent document. Um, I might just take issue. It says there are 283 risks. Um, there's one that's been missed, and that's uh, elected members who are climate change deniers. That is a risk. But anyway, um, can I ask the administration to uh, take me through why uh, 2030 was identified rather than, say, 2026 or 2027? Because, um, and the reason I ask it is that it would seem if there's a, a risk to, say, uh, the stormwater uh, uh, drainage network, which is identified as uh, an extreme one at page 98, um, isn't that going to be a risk the year before or two years before or three years before as well? So um, I could definitely answer that. So the, the risks presented in the report are using 2030 and 2090 because they align to um, standard climate projections for those time periods. So of course, there may be some risks that are present now uh, that we should take action on. Um, and then there are other risks that may only um, arise once a trigger point in terms of say maximum temperature or the number of extreme heat days over 40 degrees, et cetera, might be reached. So the, the 2030 date um, is, is not was, is basically picked um, in advance of actually understanding what our risks are. It's as a benchmark to assess our risks against. Okay, but look, uh, uh, just further to that point, I get that, um, but in another part of the report, um, it says at page 125 that we're absolutely deficient in uh, public risk disclosure and emergency management. Aren't those things that we'd want to get in place before 2030, like almost immediately? Um, yes, they're, 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 they are certainly things that we could be addressing now, and that's that next stage. Okay. And does the action plan that's anticipated uh, have as its first goal a policy? Because it's not, it's not clear to me that that would be the first thing we would do, create a policy. Sorry, um, Councillor Martin, are you talking about a climate type of policy, you're talking about a risk policy, a climate change policy? Well, I'm talking about an overarching policy, um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, and I endorse entirely the, uh, the idea of developing an action plan as part of this. But, um, you know, we've got a fairly flimsy um, lip service document that talks about our, our um, uh, commitment to uh, managing climate change. But this talks to a much bigger, more detailed picture. And therefore, it begs the question, well, should we have a policy? And if so, wouldn't that be one of the first steps or does the administration see that differently? So in terms, um, we do have a number of climate change related policies. What we don't have is an organisational climate change adaptation plan, which is what that action plan would speak to. We do have a um, community um, climate change action plan action plan, which we're part of with the seven other councils who are member of Resilient East. So um, in, in that sense, it would be looking at what are the climate risks to our business, whether they are physical risks to our buildings or risks to our services or our staff or, or our community accessing our services and staff. So um, I think that we would look at that as part of that action plan, whether there is a, a policy that needs to set across that or whether our existing risk framework um, is sufficient. Okay. And uh, how do we address, uh, um, because it, it is raised in this document, it, it uh, discloses that half of our staff surveyed, and it was a very big sample, by the way, which is great, half of our um, uh, staff surveyed think that limited funding is the principal impediment to our handling this issue. So how, how do we address that? So, sorry, Councillor Martin, the last part, the last couple of words of your um, statement, I couldn't hear them. No, that's all right. It's a funny line tonight. Um, uh, how do we address that perception among staff that we have 
limited funding and that's impacting our capacity to deal with this? I mean, is it a perception issue or is it that we're not just spending enough money? Uh, so I can't speak to the intent behind the staff. I wasn't, I didn't undertake those surveys, but I would say that, um, you know, there are many things we could do to, to address all sorts of and, um, but we don't have a never, you know, ending um, supply of, of money, like any household, it's the same situation. So the intent would be to prioritise those risks that are the highest um, and um, obviously put any funding that's available towards those and then communicate those uh, in terms of what our action plan is back into um, all areas of our staff. And the staff were all involved in this because ones that understand our business and the nuances of their particular areas um, the best. So that's why we engage so many across the organisation. Oh, and I think that's great. It's great that we did engage so many. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to add that I, this is a really important document, uh, not least because it, it actually um, assigns a, a, a risk uh, to and describes each of the substantial risks to the city uh, because of climate change. Uh, and so uh, it, it enables us to point out to critics, and there are a few critics, um, that this is uh, not imagined. Climate change is real, and it's going to have a significant financial impact on council unless we react to documents like this. Robert. Thanks uh, very much, Chair. And I, I totally echo um, Councillor Martin's um, comments. This is a really important piece. And, you know, Adelaide City Council declared an emergency, a climate emergency last year. This is um, now, you know, an opportunity for us to really step up the work that we're doing. Um, I guess to, to the issue of uh, closure of risk, and this might be a question better placed for you, CEO, um, when uh, motions are put before council, um, administration usually provides a comment looking at the uh, financial implications of a proposal. Um, would you also consider, um, as part of administration comment, um, talking about the risks uh, to climate change um, as part of your administration response? Um, because it would seem to me that that could be a way of um, ensuring there is better uh, public disclosure and flagging of risk? That could certainly form part of the adaptation action plan um, as a recommendation. So that might be something Council may wish to consider requiring. All right, thanks, uh, CEO. And I'd certainly encourage administration to consider that as part of their response because that's a very practical thing that we could do um, in terms of having uh, public oversight of risk. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Robert. Members, any further questions or points on this? No, I might just um, ask a couple of questions. Uh, just going through, going through the document, um, Michelle, and there's like it's throwing up some things here. Obviously, there are lots of um, things listed in the table. But it's, it's throwing up some things that I would have I would have hoped would have already been on our radar. So, um, uh, for example, when it's talking about you know our staff that work outdoors on on hot days or extreme weather days, I mean, you know, we live in Australia. You do get those days already, um, even if there are going to be more of them potentially. But do we have or can Mark? Can you answer me? Do we have policies and procedures in place for staff that work outdoors or, or are we making them slave away all day in 38, 40 degree weather? I can speak to that. So we absolutely do have policies um, in place. Um, but when we have seen some extreme temperatures, so for example, when we had um, uh, the uh, hottest temperature, in that January, we had a significant number of grey-headed flying foxes dying. That had exceeded our experience in the past. 
and we have staff who are out there who are um, assisting fauna rescue etc so it's understanding what the implications of this might be in terms of in the future and, and how many days back to back and, and and making sure that our policies are dynamic and adapt as things change which I know that um, they have in terms of our workplace health and safety in response to that so we absolutely do but it's also about compiling all of these risks together and making sure um, we consider them, um, you know, mm. consistently and strategically. Yeah, and I suppose in addition to that, other things that sort of leap out at me are uh, obviously the, the homeless are mentioned and, you know, the vulnerable people on the streets. I think there's a comment, uh, I haven't got it in front of me, but something about hot days will uh, reduce the thermal comfort of the vulnerable on the streets. I mean, I, I, I would have thought that was a given anyway um oh, oh absolutely and you know we do have code red um of course yeah. yeah um so but as i said it's again making sure that we're um, compiling all these risks together and ensuring that we've we're recording them in a in a consistent way like any risk register or two yeah 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 certainly um i mean i suppose there there are a few that um that are already in there but um when it comes to uh, Councillor Martin touched on funding and and, and that that came up, um, it, what is what is what is the total quantum that w that we've already got budgeted for um, uh, things like well the, the the sustainability department the things that that come under you Michelle what's the what's the sort of yearly spend on that? So we um, we have one percent of rates is allocated to the Climate Change Action Initiatives Fund. So that's specifically for um, responding to climate change, reducing our own emissions. So for example, our sustainability incentive scheme is funded out of that. Um, the Carbon Neutral Adelaide Partners Program where we support um, around 180 businesses or, or partners who are also taking action. So that 1% you know, array is in a bit over a, um, a million dollars that's targeted towards that um, and then of course we have you know staff throughout the also considering climate change just as part of their normal day-to-day um, -day operations which you see in their responses so it's it's not just the fund it's actually um, ensuring that we're integrating these considerations in all into all parts of the business yeah yeah certainly okay uh, sorry councillor martin you hand up yeah look that's uh, I, i'm really pleased that michelle raised that because this is a really significant thing when, when we talk about climate change at this council we talk about uh emissions reductions and that's that's important that's a, a really important contribution towards managing climate change but this is entirely different isn't it i mean we're actually talking here about the impacts of climate change on the way in which we do business, quite separate to that. That is to say, how we design roads, how we design footpaths, or as in Daly reported today, uh, whether we repave uh, Rundle Mall or um, whether we uh, do things entirely differently in terms of uh, the way in which we manage our assets. Uh, and therefore, I wonder whether we actually need to start thinking in terms of emissions and then climate change management separately uh, so that they attract uh, uh, the deserved consideration uh, quite separately. So um, I'm, ass I'm assuming that was a question. So in terms of the um, report, um, of course, it is talk about climate change at a but it also talks about transition risks. So transition risks arise in relation to a transition to a low carbon economy. So reducing emissions is also part of adaptation response. Um, and in the sector, we talk about mal maladaptation as well. So ensuring that we're not taking some adaptation measures that are actually um, increasing emissions. Um, so it is really important actually to consider both emissions reduction and the climate adaptation measures in improving our and increasing our resilience together. I guess 
No, that's all right. I guess that's what I'm asking, whether in fact there's a case, and, uh, you know, possibly it's rhetorical, but I, I'm asking whether in fact we ought to have separate budget considerations. I know they're related, but um, in many ways they're quite separate. So, for example, you know, um, uh, planning is impacted by, as the report notes, by climate change, and, and that requires a whole separate set of actions some of which would, you know, might lead to reduced emissions, but for which the primary purpose is to create measures to deal with, um, as you call it, uh, climate adaptation or climate change. Well, I think so. Sorry, sorry. I've just because I've got I've got some figures in front of me, and I think it is already reflected. Um, uh, looking at, at some of the services we offer, um, Phil, we've got carbon neutral and efficient organisation, expenditure 939,000, then supporting a low carbon city, 730,000, and then sustainable and climate ready city, uh, 1.127 mil. Um, at least that's the projected figures for this current financial year as of a couple months ago. So I think they are um, budgeted separately and it looks like there's 13 and a bit FTEs um, sort of at that task. Um, well, so. if that's our formal position, uh, then that's tickety-boo. I'd be quite happy to see the two treated separately, um, it, even though they are related in, in ways. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it seems that that's what's happening. But Michelle, did you want to add? No? It was probably your figures no, I was no, coming no, back No, that's, that, that's right. That's the, there are service lines. That's correct. Yeah, fantastic. All right, all good, Phil? Thank you. Okay. Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, look, I, I do agree it is an important piece of work and I think um, the fact that it is so future focused in terms of the long-term thinking around 2030 to 2090 um, and what those impacts are going to be for our services and our workforce and our assets and also um, on Adelaide as a destination. Um, I'm, the way I read it is a lot of it is to do with also how we embed this across the organisation. So through strategic planning and through our finances and of course um, I do really appreciate the fact that the assessment has been so robust in terms of looking at how uh, along the lines of corporate Australia which is sort of more in line with how a capital city works um, So and particularly with the outlook on those key assets. Um, Curious as to whether we have champions embedded across the organisation in the same way, for instance, we have reconciliation throughout the organisation. Michelle. Um, so we certainly have um, people right through our organisation who absolutely um, are committed to considering um, the you know, future and current climate on, on the work that they're doing. We don't have anyone who's sort of formally nominated as a climate change champion, um, but as you'll see in the report, we have a very well-informed organisation and staff. Um, and uh, I know we work right across every program um, and um, you know, there's a lot of commitment to um, within this organisation and our staff to make good decisions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Members, any other points? No, I just might make a couple of points um, uh, just before we move on. I suppose my concern is that we've, we've heard how uh, we've got a report here and the report is going to you know, parts of it are then going to be made into an action plan and then the action plan is going to inform the adaptation plan. Um, and, you know, we've paid for the report $25,000. We're going to pay for the action plan $35,000. But at the end of those, and I understand that it's a foundational work and planning documents, but still at the end of those, we, we haven't actually delivered um, anything. At, like infrastructure-wise, um, we haven't delivered you know, whether it's education for the community um, around sustainable initiatives, uh, whether it's extra training for our staff, 
anything like that. So at the end of that, we've had a report, we've got a plan, you know, I think there's a working group or round table or something mentioned in there. You know, it's all very, it's all very bureaucratic. It's all very local government. It sort of makes me uh, picture spinning tires in the mud um, is, is, is the problem. And then the, the fact as well that we went outside of our own organization to draft this up. I understand the need to get consultants in sometimes, but you know, we've got across our sustainable and, and sort of climate change departments, um, 12 or 13 individuals. So I would have hoped that, and, and, and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that you expect them to do everything, but when you look at the contents of the report, I don't think the city needed to pay $25,000 for someone to tell us that uh, people rough sleeping uh, get hot one during extreme weather days and that presents risk. Um, I don't think it needed that at all. I don't think it needed to tell us that, as we know, um, uh, the flying foxes fall out of the sky dead um, when there's really, really hot days consecutively. Um, and and I, I didn't need someone to tell me that uh, today. I don't need them to tell me that in 2030. And I certainly don't need them to tell me that in 2090, if you're looking at the projections. Like, if I know it as a lay person, I would hope uh, the experts that we have in the city would actually know it as well. So I suppose that's what I come back to. It's just, it's just concerning that we've got reports and plans and other plans and action groups and, and all the rest of it. I would completely appreciate the need to maintain a risk register um, and what have you. I just think the vast majority of things on the register looking at it um, uh, should have either already been there or are fairly um, self-explanatory um, from the get-go and I would rather you know I would rather us uh, invest our money and time in in things that are actually going to achieve something um, as opposed to sort of hefty tomes and foundational documents and what have you so I suppose that's that's um, some concern coming from it but look I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll leave it until um, I'll leave it until it comes up at council I think I've, I think I've rustled a couple of feathers Helen uh, we'll go to Rob first Thanks, Chair. I didn't think we were moving into debate, um, but as you've uh, started to debate the proposal, I guess um, one of the reasons why this is so important is because the Council does sometimes make decisions that are not cognizant to climate change. And we need to look no further than the decision made last month to embrace um, an initiative to try and encourage more cars to come into the CBD and to increase carbon emissions um, and congestion on our city streets. And there are a lot yeah, but Robert, of, we'll, we'll bring of it, that. We'll bring it back so to the report, this is, Robert. so, so um, having back a report concepts. by experts that identifies risks and develops strategies for things that we can do to ameliorate those, I, I think is very important. Um, and uh, if you already know it, um, Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, then you won't have any problem um, implementing the um, recommendations that come out of the action plan because hopefully they will be self-evident to you. And Helen? Thanks, Chair. Um, just a question for Michelle. Um, typically, Michelle, would a risk register include all known risks in addition to all novel risks? Uh, yes. It, right. Yeah. So, in actual fact, you'd be you'd be remiss if you didn't include all of the known existing risks. That's correct. And in terms of the staffing of the uh, the unit, uh, the sustainability unit and team, could you just give a, a summary of the many roles that the team undertakes, in addition to supporting external consultants to do these sorts of reviews? I know that that would take probably um, quite some time to give a fulsome uh, summary, but a summary of some of the key tasks that are undertaken by your team. Um, so you will see that they are all that all of those services are outlined in the service directory under three categories, um, and uh, include some of the things I've talked about before, as well as water, um, biodiversity, um, etc. So, yeah, so massive based. tasks undertaken by a relatively small number of people when you look at the work that they undertake across the city. Yes, that's great. 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. That's it. Thanks, Tia. Thanks, Helen. Phil. Uh, thank you, Chair. Look, just a question uh, to the administration. Uh, I wonder, should we be uh, uh, creating a 284 and adding the name of the Deputy Lord Mayor next to it? Is, is that appropriate? I'm not sure if that's a question that uh, Michelle uh, can answer for you, Phil. <laughs> but certainly making sure we're using our money wisely so that we can spend more on meaningful projects, uh, I think would only be a good thing. Um, any further questions, members? No? All right, fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we will now move on to 5.7, Peace Park uh, Town Clerks Walk Tree Succession Plan, Red Gum Park, Karawira Park 12. And I'll invite questions on this. No. Oh, thank you, Phil. Yeah, look, uh, a question for the administration. I, I couldn't see an arborist report. Was there one commission? In relation to the removal of the 18 mature trees. Thanks, Clinton. Uh, through the chair, I've, I've got Matthew Morrissey on the Zoom call. Councillor, I might just uh, get him to respond to that question if we could. Um, I do know that we have our own internal um, accredited arborist, so that may be the response, but just if we could just check with Matthew, Chair, please. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you, I think I'm unmuted. That's correct, uh, Clinton, and through the Chair, uh, the internal arborist had uh, undertaken an assessment of all the uh, relevant trees. Um, prior to the design uh, work uh, going, uh, prior to the design being completed. Uh, and um, I, I'm just wondering how many of these uh, Norfolk Island hibiscus are there throughout the whole of the city? Uh, through the chair, sorry, I, I can't answer that. I'll have to take that on notice. Okay, I, I, the reason I ask is I'm just wondering why these ones are suddenly a threat. I, is the tree listed under any uh, noxious weeds or plants? Or, uh, uh, what, what was the motivator to cut down these 18 mature trees? Uh, through the chair, they are otherwise known as an tree. Um, so they do have a cell that contains a whole heap of uh, fibres that uh, irritate the skin. Uh, the location of this park is uh, quite uh, or close pro proximity to the hospital. This is a relief location for people to come out and um, take respite. Unfortunately, it causes allergies uh, and concerns for those people that are sitting in the parklands. Okay, look, I, I get that. I'm just trying to understand why, why um, they have been targeted. Uh, I mean, have we declared war on the Norfolk Island hibiscus? or just these 18 trees, uh, because, you know, uh, plane trees cause lots of irritation, just ask the Lord Mayor, wh why are these ones on the list, the hit list? Uh, through the chair, uh, it's not a overarching uh, 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 take across the city as far as these particular plants. Um, the assessment was made as part of a, a succession plan uh, for this particular area and to tie in with uh, the plains trees of the existing area. Okay. So, okay, no, that's fine. I understand that. So we don't have a policy about uh, Norfolk Island hibiscus? No. Thank you. All right. Further questions, members? No, Lord Mayor, I see you smiling. No comment. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, Matthew. Um, we will now move on. Uh, staying in that part of the city, we go to 5.8, 
Draft Adelaide Oval Precinct uh, CLMP. Um, and I think uh, we're gonna have a, um, uh, just a very brief summary of this one. Uh, CLMPs are very interesting. Thank you, Clinton. Thank you, Chair. Um, evening members. Just um, a quick intro to this one, just to give some context. Um, just to note that the CLMPs um, are being updated across the entire Adelaide Parklands at the moment. And the general provisions for those CLMPs and each individual chapter of um, those CLMPs will be brought into um, Council via APLA over the coming um, months. And this just happens to be the first one. Um, it is one of the more complex ones that we have. Um, therefore, the team have worked um, diligently over the last couple of years, just updating this CLMP and it's before you tonight in draft. Um, it covers the area for Park 26 or Tantania Wama. Um, many changes have occurred in, in this precinct. This is the Adelaide Oval Precinct, as you would know, um, since about 2009. When the, when the CLMP was last updated. Um, it's also been updated now to provide consistency with the Adelaide Oval Redevelopment Act of 2011. Um, the last time uh, that this CLMP came up for uh, revision um, was actually right when the Adelaide Oval Redevelopment was occurring in 2012 through to 2014. Therefore, it wasn't updated. So that's why it's in front of you now. Um, its use, um, uh, this oval, this park's use is consistent with its location. Uh, it's with the core entertainment precinct as identified in the Adelaide Parklands Management Strategy. Um, so subject to the consideration and approval by council um, and, and the recommendation of APLA, um, of which this report's going to APLA this Thursday night, uh, we plan to release the draft um, CLMP for the statutory consultation period. Um, and of course that is subject approval by the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. So I'm um, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Clinton. Helen. Thanks, Chair. Um, if it, the proposal in here is to increase um, the number of events in Oval 2, for example, one of the changes, is there any difference in the fee that the City of Adelaide would receive if that is stipulated in the uh, CLMP versus if it's not stipulated? I, like for example, the Midnight Oil concert that was approved, if they apply and we approve versus if it's stipulated and therefore planned, is there any difference in the fee that we would receive in that instance? Uh, through the chair, um, there's nothing um, pertaining to that within the CLMP. That's not what CLMP is designed um, to achieve. However, the Adelaide Oval Licence um, does permit um, the use of Oval Number 2 already for, mm -hmm. for standalone events. What we've tried to achieve through um, the update of the CLMP is, is a cap to those number of events, um, capped at eight, um, whereby there's some control over that the, the, the use of that area for events. Um, what we could do and, and probably should do um, is consider what uh, fees and, and licences um, we can obtain through agreement with the State Management Authority around the, the use of that area. So that, that's definitely something to consider, but it would be considered separate to the ceiling. Okay. And so just um, to clarify, the, the difference that would be if, if for example, that um, recommendation were approved, having the eight, the cap of eight events, that would mean that they have the, um, I guess the certainty to know they can have at least eight events as opposed to like in the instance of the Midnight Oil concert, it came to council for approval. Would that be the difference? I'm, I'm just not quite clear on what, what to do. I understand it's a cap, but is it also that they then can, can within those parameters undertake what they choose as opposed to seeking approval each time, which then creates the uncertainty, et cetera? Through the chair, that, that's essentially correct. What, what we've found um, through the updating of the CLMP is that generally a lot of those events um, are required to be in negotiation two or three years in advance of the events. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess uh, there's the opportunity through the CLMP to seek a little bit more certainty 
around the future planning around events and activation in, in the park. So that does offer um, the ability um, for the SMA to do that. Okay, and again, to clarify, in terms of things like it referenced um, that uh, the recommendation was to give primary um, or overarching approval in certain stipulated circumstances to the oval, uh, and when not in use, community opportunity would still be made available for, for example, things like weddings. Um, in that kind of example, again, just looking at um, how the City of Adelaide potentially uh, manages, given that we do also in that proposal was that we would manage the cost of um, the uptake of the area approaching War Memorial Drive. Does, the, does any licensing come into that, um, that usage, be it community or otherwise, in terms of uh, the City of Adelaide's participation in that process, or is it all managed by the Oval once those parameters are in place? Or things like the community usage? Uh, through the through the chair, so it's um, that becomes a responsibility of the SMA, um, but obviously through the um, Adelaide Parklands Management Strategy and through this CLMP, which is consistent with the strategy, there would be the requirement for community use mm -hmm. at times when the events are not in that space. So that's the other reason for for trying to cap the number of cap the events. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Sorry, I'm not sure if Helen is talking. No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. um, so, so just so just for clarity, so if the CLMP has clarity around um, the condition of no more than eight, if they want to do more than eight can still apply to council to do more than eight? Uh, through the chair, yes, that's my understanding, Lord yeah. So it's not really a cap, it's just saying that they don't have to bring that into council each time they want to do that. Uh, what we're suggesting through the CLMP is that um, the CEO would have delegation up to that cap amount and then um, beyond that um, would require another decision of council outside. So, so given so far on Oval 2, they've had one event in 2017 and two that they uh, that were approved but didn't happen in 2019. Where did the eight come from? Or is there a plan for the Adelaide Oval that that is going to be a concert area, as in a dedicated concert area that's going to be programmed every year? Uh, through the chair... I can't speak on behalf of uh, the Stadium Management Authority about their plans for, for the number of events. Um, however, uh, we have looked at the space and the availability uh, through the calendar year to um, sequence events in that area. And, and in our opinion as administration um, and working with the SMA, there would be... Um, in our opinion, very little chance of exceeding the, the, the cap of eight. Um, in fact, it may even be difficult to fit um, a schedule of eight events in that space. Um, so ultimately, eight is an arbitrary number that we've chosen based on um, mapping out the calendar year and looking at the sequencing of events and the with other events in the city and making sure that we don't have those scenarios um, eventuate. So it is an arbitrary number for, for consideration. Okay. And also at 27.6, you've talked about effective scheduling to ensure no conflicts. And so, I mean, obviously at different times of the year, there are uh, concerts in Elder Park uh, for various other festivals and events. So how is, how is that to be managed? Is that a first come first serve or is that a, um, I'm not sure how that's managed through the CLMP. Uh, through the chair, so th through the CLMP, um, my understanding would be that this would offer us the opportunity to look at the longer term view of those um, events mm -hmm. and we actually get better line of sight to those events. And, uh, and I think if, if council could recall the Midnight Oil events, it was quite a, a last minute um, event and a last minute rush to, to get and get approval for the event, which ultimately was 
successful. So um, I think it just offers it offers the ability for planning, Lord Mayor. I think from memory that's because we didn't actually realise they needed council's approval because they'd already gone on sale um, before they came into council for approval for that midnight oil concert in 2017. Um, yep. The other thing, and going back to Councillor Donovan's comment, um, in terms of a, a consideration if there's going to be um, uh, commercial uh, concerts there, um, how would that consideration be made? Is that through licensing, um, licensing or lease? How would that be done and in what time frame would that be done? Uh, through the chair. So that, that area of Adelaide Oval number two is a part of the lease area. Yeah. Um, for the Adelaide Oval Management um, or Stadium Management Authority. So, yes, it would come under the lease requirements. Okay. And do you, sorry, I know the link's there, but do you know what the time frame is that lease is, Clinton? For, oh, or would you negotiate like an amendment or something to the lease? I would have to take that on notice. I don't know the, the yeah. duration of that agreement, but I can come back to you on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and this is on Thursday, but... Um, uh, the majority of members of APLA did actually do a walk uh, there uh, about a month ago so that we uh, could have a look at oval number two and the, the green, as you call it. Um, so, so having been on the space, I think it will be a good discussion on Thursday. Thank you, Clinton, um, for answering those questions. Good. Thank you. Phil? Sure. Um, yes, look, some questions for the administration. Um, how many contacts, uh, meetings and phone calls has the administration had with the Stadium Management Authority about this? Uh, yeah, in, in regards to this CLMP, Councillor? Yes. Yep. Um, I would have to take that on notice so I couldn't answer that off the top of my head. But more than one. Um, well, I've been in one, so okay, that, that may be the case. I'm not too sure. I can get back to you on that. Okay. Now, this CLMP generally these are undertaken in parks. This is Park Twenty Six, but this CLMP doesn't include. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Elder Park, uh, Pinky Flat, Bar Smith Walk. Um, are there any other areas that it doesn't include? I'm just um, looking. Yeah, through the chair, I've actually got Rick Hutchins on the on the Zoom as well, Councillor. I think you're correct, but I might just, if I could refer that to Rick, just to be absolutely certain. Um, Rick, are you there? Thanks, Rick. Uh, yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I yes, can hear you. Okay. Yeah, um, probably easiest uh, count. So the map on page 200, the areas highlighted show the parts of the park that are subject to, to this CLMP, um, excluding the core area, which is excluded by the Adelaide Oval Act. So Pinky Flat, the areas near the river and Elder Park are excluded from this for consideration in this report. Okay, but they're, they're Park 26 too. They are Park yep. 26, yes. Yep. Um, so we're basically looking at the Adelaide Oval um, uh, management area and next door. I note at 29, it says the SMA has prepared a high level plan outlining how events uh, would be managed. Um, I can't see that anywhere. Is that attached to the documents or is that going to be provided separately? Um, through the chair, yes, they have provided a, guess, an operational plan, which gives an indication of their, is how they would manage individual events. I don't just look, do believe it's, it's, yeah, it's not included with the agenda. So we could, we could provide that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any reason why the administration hasn't mentioned in the papers that in 2016, the uh, SMA presented to council a plan for each of the areas under consideration, 
which included the creation of an amphitheater in Pennington Gardens, a screen to enable fans who weren't able to pay the fee to go inside the Oval to consume alcohol while watching a large screen of matches, as well as a plan for concerts in other areas. Is there any reason why that information isn't in there? That 2016 proposal? Um, through the chair, maybe Claire, do you have um, the context on that one? Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor. So you remember at the time we made sure through a council resolution that um, there was a um, resolution on the books that um, didn't support that. It was to residential areas too close to uh, spaces um, that we felt were inappropriate for that type of um, permitted use. So there is a council resolution, I'm pretty sure, from the books back in 2016 that said no. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is this is uh, seemingly a very similar proposal. Why, why isn't the 2016 resolution of council, the community outrage, the subsequent public meetings, why is none of that included in the documentation? Uh, through the chair, I think, um Deputy CEO may have just answered that question, I believe, but uh, happy to happy to take the question on notice and, and come back to you. I, um, sorry, through the through the chair, um, it, it was dealt with in 2016. Nothing has changed in terms of um, any policy from um, council or um, any policy from um, administration. So, um, my understanding is we still have a resolution on the books that does not allow that and doesn't support it. Uh, okay, uh, but it, it, this to all intents and purposes is the same proposal. That is entertainment venues in Creswell Gardens, Pennington Gardens with crowds of up to 5,000 people, uh, Stella Bowen Park, crowds of up to $1,500 at events uh, and at Adelaide Oval, crowds of up to 15,000. This is exactly the same proposal. Um, through the presiding member, it's not. The um, previous proposal back in 2016 talked to full scale concerts um, in that full northern area, right up to the boundary, to the residential areas of up to 26,000 people at any one time. Um, I don't think that's um, being proposed tonight. Uh, well, look, I, I, I beg to differ, and, and look, I'm, I'm sorry, but. Uh, if you have 5,000, 5,000, 15,000, and uh, uh, 1,500, then that's um, uh, 26,500 people. So th that would seem to me. But, but look, I, I, I won't labour that. Um, uh, look, I, I do wonder why also we are proposing to endorse um, car parking on Adelaide Oval 2. Um, uh, when we have not done so before. Is there a reason why we would agree to allow 1,350 vehicles to park on Adelaide Oval 2? Uh, through the chair, um, I might pose that question to Rick, if that's okay. Um, my understanding is that um, the car parking uh, on Adelaide Oval number two was, is already something that's permitted through the, uh, through the license agreement, but I'll refer to Rick. Uh, uh, look, just for the sake of, of clarity, um, the license agreement, and I have it somewhere here in the documents, allows for um, the use of the Adelaide Oval 2 for um, circumstances or events that are ancillary to sporting events. Um, uh, so that wouldn't require the jump to say that ancillary events uh, or things that are ancillary to sporting means car parking, in which case that has policy implications for all of the parklands, does it not? Um, through the chair, I think I can respond to that is that the intent of the draft CLMP would be to continue the existing, or to make clear the existing license conditions 
and approvals that apply to Oval 2. I'm happy to check, recheck the wording to ensure we're maintaining that intent and not changing the current, current requirements. Well, I guess the question I'm asking is, uh, it, 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 does the administration regard ancillary uses and car parks as one and the same things? I think my answer is, yeah. Okay, Sorry. okay. Yeah. Um, all right, look, it's also proposed as part of this plan that we allow the structure of a 100-person um, seating area at Adelaide Oval 2. Um, wh where is that? There's no plan here that I can see. Is that to be uh, on the Montefiore side, uh, closer to the car park, near the tennis centre? Um, that's part of what we're approving. Sorry, again, I uh, think I'd have to. There is reference to uh, 100 seats there, councillors. So, um, Rick, do you have the um, background? I don't. That? I don't have. Certainly, there is reference to that. I don't have the exact location of that would be uh, on me. I'm again I'm happy to provide that information. It looks like Claire, Claire Matt. Claire's got a hand up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, through the chair, sorry, just to go back to 2016 and those initial discussions, part of the assessment of some of those early concerts that council gave approval for on oval number two was location of speakers and location of any corporate hospitality stand. My understanding is that that 100 person stand would be consistently placed on the Montefiore side, councillor. So you might remember. Um, some of those uh, couple of concerts, it was over right next to Montefiore. That's my understanding uh, of the intent. Yeah. Look, I, I may be misinterpreting and I, I will accept your guidance, but at page 226, um, I, I am reading that as a permanent 100 person seating facility. Is that the wrong reading? I mean, um, if it was temporary, yeah. you wouldn't need to mention it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, Rick, um, my understanding is that wouldn't be a permanent structure, but Rick, you'll need to confirm, please. Yeah. My reading of that is that would be related to the to the use of Oval 2 for, for the sporting activities would be um, an addition to, yeah, what is in the park at the moment. So that's so it would be a permanent, yeah. Yep. But I, okay. I don't have the details before me. Um, look, I, I, I wonder, rather than what is clearly what the SMA would like, is, is there a reason why we haven't said to people, what would you like to see in Pennington Gardens, Creswell Gardens, rather than... Complexity with this particular CLMP is that it also has to take into account several leases and licence areas um, in the park. So this is typically a little bit more complex um, than a normal CLMP, but the intention of putting the draft CLMP out to consultation uh, is to obtain that feedback and then hopefully incorporate that feedback in. So that is the, the purpose. Uh, 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 but we haven't asked things like we do with other CLMPs. We ask uh, people, for example, um, should liquor be on sale or we stipulate very often in licenses as a consequence of consultation, liquor is not to be sold. But we, we haven't done that in this case. Is there a reason for that or it's just something you're hoping you'll get feedback on? Uh, through the chair, like I said, a, a lot of those requirements are covered under the current um, lease and licensing arrangements. Um, but we, if we do receive that feedback, we'll certainly consider that in the, uh, in the report. And so, Councillor, if I could just add, um, in relation to the other parkland spaces covered by the CLMP, we've got existing policy in place, such as the um, Adelaide Parklands Events Plan. So that stipulates quite clearly um, the types of events that Council will or won't support in those areas and spaces. Um, uh, so that, that's an existing policy. No, I understand that. But uh, uh, is it correct that the current policy, say, for Creswell's uh, Gardens, does not allow for events hosting up to 5,000 people? I'd need to check. I don't have the um, Adelaide Events uh, Management Plan with me tonight. OK. Well, look, uh, Chair, thank you very much uh, for your um, allowing me to ask those questions. If I may just observe, 
um, that following so closely onto the, um, uh, the discussion within the community about part two and the crows, um, I think that this is bound to draw enormous controversy in the community, not least because it's only four years since the community let council know in a very loud and forthright fashion that it is not acceptable for there to be events of the nature that are proposed here, that is large attendance events, so close to residential areas, so close to a war memorial, so close to a church which holds regular services and, and events such as funerals and weddings. Uh, moreover, it is not appropriate for it to be so close to university residential colleges. Um, and uh, uh, I just can't imagine why we are entertaining the SMA again, um, when each time they put proposals of this nature forward, there is such a negative reaction. I, I just don't get it. But I look forward to the discussion in council. Please, Ocean. Did you want to? Was there something you had to add there? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just want to, some clarification from Councillor Martin, who suggested um, he wanted to understand how many meetings and phone calls, etc., had occurred with the SMA. To clarify with you. I guess um, the intent of that and the, the duration, are you, over what period are you seeking that information and for what purpose? I'm trying to understand why, uh, well, to whom we have spoken. Uh, my second question was be, to be, which other organisations or individuals have you spoken to? And I'm trying to understand the extent to which the SMA has been involved in the development of this uh, proposal for public consultation. Nothing more, nothing less. So just to clarify then, it's during the creation of the review of this um, CLMP. Yep. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Just muted myself. All right, no further questions on that. No. No, excellent. Well, I think that brings us to the end of the, oh no, sorry, 5.9. Asset accounting policy and fixed asset guidelines. Um, any questions on this one? I thought it was pretty straightforward. Oops. No, Phil? Are you? Did you I just wanted to say to the administration, thank you. Oh, excellent. Well, I'm sure they would say you're very welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> excellent. Any further points, members? No? Okay. I, I would just say thank you as well. I, I think it's an excellent, um, uh, I think it's an excellent uh, policy and framework you've put in place. Obviously, it's been the subject of discussion at audit committee as well. Um, and, and I think it's very important for us to have that sort of uniform approach across the organisation and in line with what other uh, similarly sized organisations do as well. Um, I think it'll be uh, really beneficial and it is best practice. So um, hat off to you. Uh, Claire and to your team for uh, putting it in place. And I'll just do one more check, members. No. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all for your attendance. I'll declare the meeting closed at 8.53.